Hello everyone, my name is Mark and I'm a librarian at the Gwinnett County Public Library. I'm pleased to welcome you to Read with Pride, LGBTQ plus authors and books through the years. Read with Pride is part of the library's celebration of LGBTQ Pride Month, an annual month-long celebration every June of LGBTQ culture, politics, history, and civil rights. There is a rich history of LGBTQ plus literature, and today's presentation will explore individual authors and books throughout the decades, along with the cultural impact these works have had. The focus will be on adult fiction today, and while I've made every effort to include a large and diverse group of authors and titles, you may or may not be familiar with all the works and authors mentioned here. I hope this will be a great introduction, starting point, for your journey into LGBTQ plus literature. What is LGBTQ plus? The acronym refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and the plus refers to the broad spectrum of genders and sexualities present in society. The phrase is constantly evolving and is a descriptive, culturally sensitive way to convey information about these communities. And by the way, these this terminology can be used quite easily and is very useful when searching the library's catalog. This program's focus is about LGBTQ fiction from 1900 to the present. So, sincere apologies to Sappho and Sophocles and all the other writers whose significant ancient works I am skipping over. But before I begin at 1900, it's important to acknowledge one writer whose works fall just shy of the 20th century, a crucial figure in modern LGBTQ plus letters. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was an Irish writer and bon vivant who has long been considered a pioneer in modern LGBTQ plus literature. His work is some of the most revered in Western literature, plays, novels, and children's stories, most notably the sensual and mysterious novel The Picture of Dorian Gray and the spirited and gleeful play The Importance of Being Earnest. Wilde's writing featured considerable gay subtext, while his personal life was more explicit regarding his own homosexuality. In fact, he and his paramour, the poet Lord Alfred Douglas, alluded to their relationship as the love that dare not speak its name. In 1895, Wilde was arrested, stood trial, and was ultimately convicted in a London court for gross indecency, a crime created specifically to prosecute homosexual males. This exchange between Wilde and the prosecutor about his work is typical of the themes of the case. Wilde was sentenced to two years hard labor and later died in 1900, exiled and penniless in Paris. His grave is one of the most widely visited in the French National Cemetery and usually covered in kisses by exuberant visitors, and it has been designated by France as an historic landmark. So first up is 1900 to 1940, a delicate balance. While the order of these lists is largely chronological by decade, it is also somewhat thematic. We'll begin with the years between 1900 and 1940. Important fiction appeared frequently in the early part of the 20th century, but it is necessary to understand that because society vehemently disapproved of gay and lesbian characters, the dominant culture all but demanded that these characters be punished for what was deemed their immoral lifestyles. These characters, facing frequent moral condemnation, were fraught with self-loathing, and many met grim fates, desolation, loneliness, even suicide or murder. The so-called arbiters of morality at the time wielded much ferocious power in this area, and it is remarkable that any of these titles were ever even published. Up until the late 1950s, many authors and publishers, including those in the United States, could be prosecuted for writing openly about homosexuality. Three Lives by Gertrude Stein, 1909. Three working class women face the challenges of race and sexuality in society. Stein, an American 
born author, lived most of her life in Paris, and hosted a revered salon where she had a huge impact on the leaders of modernism, including Picasso, Fitzgerald, and Hemingway. Maurice by E. M. Forster, this is an intense affair between a Cambridge student and a stable hand, shattering the conventions of both romance and class. Maurice, or to use the official British pronunciation, Morris, was actually written in 1914, but not published until 1971, a year after Forster's death, as per his wishes. The Fox by D. H. Lawrence, 1922, World War I soldier upsets the balance of a delicate relationship between two women. Much of Lawrence's work, including his other novels, Women in Love and Lady Chatterley's Lover, have been banned or heavily censored throughout the 20th century. Orlando, a biography by Virginia Woolf, 1928, a rollicking, subversive story of a multi-gendered character who lives for centuries meeting the key figures of English literary history. Married to publisher Leonard Wolfe, Vita Virginia Woolf was also actually bisexual and had a long-term relationship with author Vita Sackville West. The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, 1928. A young woman heroically challenges society to accept her non-conforming passion. After a U.S. court determined it was not a corrupting influence, a special variety victory edition was published in 1929. Scarlet Pansy by Robert Scully, 1933. Ahead of its time story of gender expression and same-sex desire, the dust jacket of this rather unambiguously titled book promises to explore the, quote, fairy subculture of New York City, unquote. Maybe that's a regrettable characterization, but at least the non-conforming fairy protagonist is celebrated and not pathologized for his non-conformity. Some further reading from 1900 to 1940 that you might want to consider. Remembrance of Things Past, Marcel Proust's epic classic, one of the most significant works of the 20th century. Ronald Furbank was an openly gay author who wrote novels that were short on plot but filled with humorous dialogue and eccentric characters. The Immoralist, a sensual work by Oscar Wilde protege and Nobel Prize winner André Gide. Dejuna Barnes' Nightwood depicts female sexuality in Europe between the world wars. Strange Brother by Blair Niles depicts LGBTQ life among African Americans in the New York neighborhood of Harlem. Better Angel, Foreman Brown's autobiographical novel chronicling a young gay man's awakening, and it miraculously manages to give the protagonist a rare romantic happy ending with another man. And Death in Venice, Thomas Mann's novella, a sensitive look at one man's obsession with age and beauty. Now 1940 to 1970, The Pillars. A remarkable number of significant works with more explicit LGBT characters and themes appeared in mid-century fiction. In many cases, some of these novels were even popular bestsellers. And in most of these books, characters still lived on the margins, but they were attempting to live happily and with dignity. The Friendly Young Ladies by Barry, Mary Renault, 1944, a comic love story, between a writer and a nurse during World War II. Our Lady of the Flowers by Jean Genet, 1943, a largely autobiographical account of a young man's journey through the Parisian underworld, populated mostly by homosexuals on the fringes of society. Genet wrote the original while imprisoned for theft in 1943. The manuscript was discovered by the prison guards, confiscated and burned, so Genet eventually had to rewrite it. Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh, 1945, the British aristocracy during the Golden Age, just before the Second World War. While the dynamic between the two friends, Charles and Sebastian, is homosexual in nature, it is not explicitly sexual. Here are two important works by Christopher Isherwood. Isherwood was a novelist, playwright, and diarist 
whose personal style was a fusion of fiction and autobiography, revealing much of his life through elegant narrative prose. He's born in England, lived for a time in Germany, and ultimately settled in California. The Berlin Stories from 1945, this novella explores the lives of expatriates living in Germany during the early years of the Nazis' rise to power, all quite oblivious to the political horrors to come. It features considerable homosexual content, and it uh, was turned into a Broadway musical and Oscar-winning film, Cabaret. And a single man, 20 years after Berlin Stories, Isherwood published this daring and poignant portrayal of a day in the life of a lonely middle-aged man in Isherwood's adopted state of California. Two authors who definitely belong together on one screen. The City and the Pillar by Gore Vidal, 1948. Two young men explore a brief amorous encounter that changes both their lives forever. A landmark novel and the first post-war work to feature explicit gay sexuality and characters. Significantly, the original 1948 ended featuring a major character being murdered, but in 1965 Vidal himself voluntarily revised the ending and the character lived. Other Voices, Other Rooms, also published in 1948 by Truman Capote. Southern Gothic, noted for its isolation and decadence, the story of a 13-year-old's coming of age in rural Alabama. So a bit more on Gore and Truman, always worth more than just a mere mention. Uh, got a little more to share on them. Throughout his life, Vidal detested labels and was deeply opposed to phrases like gay writer and gay literature, I'm guessing he would not have approved of this program's theme, especially when he was often quoted as saying the following quote you see on the screen. And by the way, this won't be the last we hear of Vidal. Capote's debut novel's first edition was also noteworthy for the provocative author photo of the 23-year-old Capote photographed by Harry Halma, seen here. Though tame by today's standards, it caused quite a sensation at the time, something the attention-seeking Capote became very good at throughout his life. Capote and Vidal entertained audiences with a decades-long bitter literary feud. In fact, when Capote died in 1984, Vidal called it a smart career move. The theater has long been considered a safe space for LGBTQ authors. Characters on the stage can provide audiences with a voice, and the sense of immediacy resonates with audiences, sometimes in ways that prose cannot. And while there has been some great and popular and profound plays throughout the later part of the 20th century about the LGBTQ community, all of them owe a debt to the godfather of the genre, Tennessee Williams. Through powerful dialogue, larger-than-life characters, and inventive subtext, these three hit plays, A Streetcar Named Desire, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, and Suddenly Last Summer, were bold and innovative works of art that focused on desire, both heterosexual and homosexual, and are still widely performed today. Now three forceful novels about sexuality and the constraints and privileges of masculinity and its effect on the culture. Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima, 1949. The story of Kokan, an adolescent boy tortured by his burgeoning attraction to men. A giant of Japanese literature known for his unification of beauty, eroticism, and death. Many say Mishima was tormented by trying to reconcile his homosexuality with his sense of masculinity and honor. In 1970, he committed seppuku, a ritual form of Japanese suicide once practiced by the samurai. City of Night by John Reshi, 1963. This daring novel introduced readers to the underground world of male prostitution, drag queens, and street denizens. It was a surprise bestseller that provoked curiosity and outrage. This was no love story. It was a straightforward novel about sex and thus a radical departure from the norm. And Reflections in a Golden Eye by Carson McCullers, 1941. This is McCullers' debut novel, a controversial look at oppressive masculinity in both the U.S. military 
and America's Deep South. Here are three moving stories of love and passion between women. Olivia by Dorothy Stracy, 1949. Love story about a young British girl's infatuation with her French headmistress. was published by Leonard and Virginia Woolf's Hogarth Press. The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, 1952. A tender depiction of a secret romance between a suburban housewife and a young salesgirl. Originally published under a pseudonym, it was reissued in 84 and published under the author's name, and adapted in 2015 into a movie starring Kate Blanchett entitled Carol. And Desert of the Heart, two women separated by age and background meet at a boarding house and fall in love. Classic of romantic literature by this Canadian author and playwright who was an early and prominent feminist and lesbian rights advocate. Two books by James Baldwin are essential reads from this era. One of the first activists and authors to write openly about the gay African-American experience and explore intricacies of racial, sexual, and class distinctions in mid-20th century America. Giovanni's Room from 1956, an American man living in Paris must explore his feelings and frustrations with other men in his life. And from 1962, another country set in Greenwich Village and Harlem in the late 1950s. It portrays many themes that were taboo at the time of its release, including infidelity, bisexuality, and interracial couples. And Gore Vidal returns, Myra Breckenridge, 1968. After City and the Pillar, Vidal spent much of his time writing political essays and popular historical novels. He came roaring back, however, with this novel, probably the biggest selling book on this list. It is the story of the hero, Myron, who becomes the heroine, Myra, by undergoing a, quote, clinical sex change, unquote. That is wording from 1968, by the way. It's an irreverent satire of late 1960s America and one of the first novels to address pansexuality. Now, be warned, there is a truly terrible 1970 film version with Raquel Welch as Myra, and oddly enough, Mae West. As one film critic at the time put it, it is, quote, hypnotically awful and audaciously dreadful. A popular genre at the time also made room for LGBTQ characters, though not ones that were necessarily portrayed in a positive light. The Pulp Fiction books of the 1940s and 50s. These were cheaply produced paperbacks with sensational themes, mostly available in drugstores and dime stores. Not much positive to say about the titles or the character here, especially one Mr. Rodney Manlove. Lesbian characters and lesbian themed stories were especially popular in this genre, though most books were on the salacious side and unfortunately were mostly mass-marketed to capture the voyeuristic sensibilities of heterosexual men. There was one considerable bright spot in this genre for lesbians, though, and her name is Anne Bannon. She was one Pulp Fiction author who actually wrote pulpy lesbian fiction for lesbians. Her Bebo Brinker Chronicles remains a favorite of readers. Published between 1947 and 1962, the series explored the lives and loves of Laura, Beth, and Bebo as they navigate uncharted territories of love. And some further reading from these decades. A Queer Kind of Death by George Baxt, the first gay African-American detective, was featured in this book. Midnight Cowboy by James O'Herlihy. One critic said that reading the book would, quote, turn people homosexual, unquote. Mrs. Fisher Hears the Mermaid Singing, a novel by Mae Sarton, and Queer by the provocative Beat Generation writer William S. Burroughs. 1970 to 2000, Assimilation and Activism. The isolation, guilt, and tragedy of earlier novels was replaced by narratives of courage and defiance that deal with LGBTQ characters in more frank and positive ways. In other words, these are peak gay and lesbian fiction years, though they often preclude other sexual identities. The dramatic development in LGBTQ fiction occurred in the 1970s, and there's 
probably a very specific incident that contributed to why this narrative freedom came about. Stonewall The Stonewall Riots, a series of spontaneous three-night demonstrations by members of the LGBTQ community, many of whom were young, transgendered, and people of color, in response to police raids that began in the early morning hours of June 28, 1969 at the Stonewall Inn in the Greenwich Village neighborhood of New York City. This event marked the beginning of what was then referred to as the Modern Gay Liberation Movement. Most post-Stonewall LGBTQ fiction focused on four specific themes that readers really responded to. Coming out, community, love and romance, and desire and sexuality. It was a moment that was less ambiguous, and gay and lesbian characters began to appear in literature with increasing frequency. However, many of the novels of the 70s and 80s that got noticed were by and about the social experiences and assimilation of white gay men, while lesbian fiction and stories by people of color were often marginalized, and the transgender experience was virtually unwritten at this time. Coming out. In literature, the coming out story has always been a durable subject in fiction for years, even to this present day. It helps readers come to terms with their own identities. Coming out is a popular motif because it is so universal. All LGBTQ people must, at some time or other, come out, make others aware of their identity. It is often fraught with pain and struggle, but can also lead to an overwhelming sense of joy and empowerment. 1973 saw the controversial and highly popular publication of two comically moving and somewhat risque coming-of-age stories about growing up gay and lesbian in America. Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. Many women felt this novel reflected their own lives and experiences. It's a story of Molly Bolt, the adopted daughter of a poor Florida family who embraces her lesbianism from an early age. The author is known these days for her popular Sneaky Pie Brown mystery series. And The Best Little Boy in the World by Andrew Tobias. The best little boy in the world is always at the top of his class, always honored mom and dad, deferred to elders, excelled in sports, and was the model IBM executive. And sometimes he was gay. First published under a pseudonym, it was re-released with the author's real name, and if you will allow me a personal reflection here, this book was my introduction to LGBTQ literature as a boy, and it had a profound impact on my life. And much like the author's original effort to remain anonymous, I snuck this book out of my local library under my coat. I didn't want the librarian to see what my 12-year-old self was checking out. Now, of course, I do not condone this behavior, neither then or now especially now in 2022, because the library is a place of inclusion and respect, and librarians welcome all kinds of readers and stories. So don't put that LGBTQ book under your coat now. Remember, you can check out with pride. A Boy's Own Story, 1982, the unnamed narrator coming of age amid conformity of the 1950s and he struggles to embrace his sexuality. White is considered the elder of LGBTQ letters, having written numerous novels, essays, and an autobiography. He's also the co-author of the illustrated book, The Joy of Gay Sex, published to great scandal and fanfare in 1977. Here are three vastly different explorations of lesbian life in the 1970s. Differences that address class, race, feminism, family, and home. Zami, A New Spelling of My Name by Audre Lorde, 1982, a fierce love letter to the strong women and, quote, downtown gay girls, unquote, in her life. Lord considered it a biomythography, myth excuse me, combining history, biography, and mythology. A self-described black lesbian mother, warrior poet, Lord wrote honestly about intersectionality and dedicated both her life and her writing to social justice. Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, 1985, by Jeanette Winterson, a sensitive British 
teenager rebels against the conventional values of her Pentecostal, co Pentecostal community. The debut novel of an English writer whose later novels explored gender polarities and sexual identity. And Stir Fry by Emma Donahue, 1994, a poignant, funny, and sharply insightful story that explores friendship, feminism, and ideas of sisterhood. Donahue is a popular Irish-Canadian author whose 1910 novel, Room, was a huge bestseller. Community. Community is one of the most important facets in gay life. We need community to connect with others, share passions and ideas, and receive validation for who we are and who we love. Two tremendously popular series debuted in this era and are still popular with generations of new readers. Tales of the City by Armistead Maupin, published as a series between 1978 and 2016. Tales of lust, love, and friendship among the eccentric inhabitants of an old apartment house in 1970s San Francisco. This is the first book in a wildly popular nine-volume series that continued through 2016. Maupin, a journalist and Vietnam Navy veteran, began the series as weekly installments in various San Francisco newspapers. Dykes to Watch Out For by Allison Bechdel, 1983 to 2008. This is a cult favorite comic strip about the lives, loves, and politics of a cast of characters, most of them lesbians, living in a mid-sized American city. It ran serially in many LGBTQ newspapers for 25 years and was one of the earliest representatives of lesbians in popular culture. Bechdel is a cartoonist whose graphic novel Fun Home was adapted into a Tony Award-winning Broadway musical. A Home at the End of the World by Michael Cunningham, 1990. Childhood Friends Redefined the Definitions of Love and Family in this moving bestseller. People in Trouble by Sarah Schulman, also 1990. A raw of its time story about urban struggles and love during the onset of AIDS. This novel is thought to be an inspiration for the musical Rent. Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions by Larry Mitchell, 1977. Still relevant today, Mitchell's fable creates a sexually liberated world of LGBTQ communal living. He has long been a forceful writer who blends LGBTQ romance with searing critiques of capitalism, assimilation, and the patriarchy. And the book's title alone was enough to make it shocking, and it was considered the very essence of gay chic, a dubious and very dated 1970s phrase that ostensibly celebrated the gay community's ascendance from subculture to pop culture. Like People in History by Felice Picano, 1995, an epic narrative chronicling gay life and subculture in America over the second half of the 20th century. Picano is one of the founders of modern gay literature. Love and Romance. Remember Oscar Wilde's Love That Dare Not Speak Its Name? Well, it finally did speak its name and had a strong, prominent voice in post-Stonewall fiction. Or as one critic in the late 70s said, the love that dare not speak his name won't shut up. First up is The Front Runner by Patricia Nell Warren, a daring, passionate love story between a college running coach and his star athlete, noted for being the first contemporary gay romance to achieve mainstream commercial and critical success, selling over 10 million copies. And Warren also wrote two sequels, Harlan's Race and Billy's Boys. For years, the actor Paul Newman tried to get a film made from this novel, with him playing the coach, but to no avail. Newman said several producers actually offered to film it if he cast a woman as the track star. And Ernesto by Umberto Saba, Saba's unfinished novel, written in 1953 but published posthumously in 1975, tells the story of a young, affluent Italian youth's sexual awakening with an older working-class man. The Lord Won't Mind, Gordon Merritt, 1970, first volume in a trilogy that tells the story of Peter and Charlie, who begin a love affair at their Ivy League college in the 1960s. The Lost Language of Cranes by David Levitt, 1986, father and son must come to terms with their respective sexual identities. 
Two great stories set in the South and featuring moving love stories between women. The Color Purple by Alice Walker, 1985. The Lives of Black Women in 1930s Rural Georgia. It features a tender love story between two main characters, Shug and Seeley. This highly lauded novel helped to usher in a new era of gay literary visibility in the 80s and 90s. And just after that, Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whipple Whistle Stop Cafe by Fanny Flagg, 1987. The South in all its terror and glory. The story of the horrors of racism and also featuring a youthful romance between the likable Ruth and Iggy. Both film adaptations of these books, The Color Purple in 1985 from director Steven Spielberg and Fried Green Tomatoes in 1991, featured extremely watered-down versions, almost non-existent, really, of the lesbian romances between each couple. If you want to experience a more fully developed sense of these characters and their stories, read the books instead. Desire and Sexuality Writing about sexuality and desire can be fraught with controversy and great expectations. Did the author go too far? Not far enough? The 1970s and beyond featured many novels about burgeoning sexuality among LGBTQ characters, writing that could sometimes be daring and very explicit. Two 1978 novels that chronicle the emerging gay male community in 1970s New York with a focus on recreational drug use and sexual promiscuity were Faggots by Larry Kramer and Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran. These days, that phrase, sexual promiscuity, is a bit problematic, implying a moral judgment, but it was often used in the 70s and 80s to describe sexually active gay men. These are probably the most sexually explicit gay novels ever published up to that time, and both were often criticized and even condemned by members of the gay community for what many considered to be negative portrayals of gay men. And there it is again, that word in the title, faggots, a perfect illustration of how ambiguity really was disappearing from LGBTQ literature. Titles do not get any less ambiguous than faggots. The Gilda Stories by Jewel Gomez, 1991, the experiences of a black bisexual heroine. These stories challenge the assumptions about the vampire myth. Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg, 1993, the journey of a young butch lesbian in the pre-Stonewall gay drag bars of a blue-collar town. Feinberg's fiction and nonfiction helped to lay the groundwork for much of the language and the awareness around modern gender studies, bringing these issues to a mainstream audience. The Rules of Attraction, 1987, by Breck Easton Ellis, a satire of sexuality, gay, straight, and bisexual, set in a New England college at the height of the Reagan era. Basketball Jones by E. Lynn Harris, 1994, the story of a closeted basketball star who decides to marry a woman so the media and his teammates will not find out he is gay. Harris was best known for his depictions of race, bisexuality, and self-acceptance. Many of his books shed light on a segment of society that had received little attention. Black men who are publicly heterosexual and secretly have sex with men. This was something that was referred to in the very inelegant language of the times being on the down low. There are two very different Londons to discover in these particular books. Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters, written in 1998, a Dickensian adventure set in 1890s England about a woman's erotic journey through London and her relationship with a male impersonator. And the Swimming Pool Library, 1988, gay life in England before the rise of Thatcherism and the devastation of AIDS. You cannot discuss post-Stonewall LGBTQ fiction without discussing the impact of HIV AIDS. The era produced some wonderful, remarkable writing from members of this community, essential works documenting the devastation of the era, and sadly, because the disease wiped out almost an entire generation of mostly gay male authors, 
preventing them from finding their voices and sharing their story. One of the best on this list is 86th by David Feinberg. He actually died just after the publication of this book. As the century came to a close, books with significantly more diverse characters and stories began to catch the eye of publishers, and LGBTQ fiction would soon be a reflection of the culture, such as The Persian Boy, Kiss of the Spider Woman, The Object of My Affection, and more. We'll move away a bit from the specific authors, because happily, being known as an LGBTQ author now does not bring one the notoriety it once did. However, authors still must challenge themselves to tell relevant stories that have a broad appeal. And though this panel may seem like an assault on your eyes, it is overcrowded with book covers to make a point. The vast availability of diverse titles. Gone are the days when most books featured young gay white males and their adventures in San Francisco or New York, although as Jerry Seinfeld once said, not that there's anything wrong with that. Here's a brief look at some of the most authentic LGBTQ books that seek to redefine our modern community. More diverse characters, stories, and authors, plus a variety of cultures, races, and ethnicities, and gender identities represented in modern literature, giving visibility to often ignored communities. On this panel alone, we have books and authors representing Vietnam, Korea, the American South, upstate New York, Sri Lanka, northern Italy, Bulgaria, Nigeria, Mexico, Ireland, the Old West, India, Victorian London, Jamaica, and Brooklyn. Because of society's increasing acceptance of LGBTQ themes in popular culture, storytellers can go beyond sexual orientation to address themes of family, identity, age, race, gender, and more, and in every genre. And here are some examples from this list. At Swim, Two Boys. Two young boys experience love and revolution during Ireland's 1916 Easter Uprising. A young black lesbian dreaming of becoming a rap star. A young Indian American boy struggle to fit in. He likes ballet and he loves playing with his mother's makeup. And a girl in 1960s war-torn Nigeria come to terms with her sexuality, learning to live and love openly. While it is not my intention to single out transgender fiction per se, I do think it is important to give you a look at some of the available titles in this area. It is a relatively new theme in fiction, full of broadly diverse scenarios and characters. It is very existence after a century of neglect is revolutionary and worth pointing out. Here are some books whose themes and or authors span the gender spectrum give you a couple of seconds to take a look at some of these titles and authors. Next, authors have gone from being marginalized artists to the mainstream, and there is no better illustration of that than the emergence of popular LGBTQ plus genre fiction. Genre writing is characterized by similarities in style or subject matter, and some stories even feature characters whose gender and sexual identity is almost secondary to the plot. Take a look at romance. Romance of all kinds, contemporary, erotica, regency, paranormal, bodice rippers. Interestingly, some LGBTQ romances that focus on gay men have been written by cisgender heterosexual women. Mystery and Suspense, probably the most popular of all the genres. It's not too much of a stretch to maintain that there are some similarities between the crime narrative and coming out. Withheld secrets, puzzle pieces, the wonder of the reveal. A quick note on Joseph Hansen down here in the red book cover. He's considered a leader in this genre. His series of novels featuring gay private eye David Brandsetter began life in 1970, and it was one of the earliest of the gay detective novels. 
fantasy sci-fi, though it often thought sci-fi is often thought to be geared to the cisgender male reader, fantasy sci-fi has actually become the genre that has perhaps come the farthest in addressing issues of inclusivity and gender diversity. And historical fiction, name your favorite era of time, and there's sure to be a couple of LGBTQ historical novels that take place then, ancient Greece, the U.S. Civil War, the Victorian era, and so on. Some historical fiction takes place during horrific episodes from the past, such as the Civil War. Two books about runaway slaves in love are on this, including The Prophets, and Amy and Jaguar about two women falling in love in Nazi Germany. Graphic novels, they burst onto the scene in the 70s, and since then readership has soared. By their very nature, they feature works that is diverse, progressive, and inclusive. And don't forget short stories. These collections provide authors with an opportunity to explain writing, explore writing styles that can underscore their versatility. A major 1970s and 80s phenomenon that I wanted to talk about a little, the LGBTQ plus bookstores. The 1970s saw the emergence and growth of the gay bookstore, and while the digital age has taken a toll on these kind of independent businesses, during their heyday, they provided not only access to books, not available anywhere, but a commons space for the community that was a refreshing change from gay bars and nightclubs. There's the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, the first gay bookstore I ever went in, Outright from Atlanta, Cherish Books and More, still thriving in Atlanta, Giovanni's Room, a great bookstore that was in Philadelphia, and a couple of others that you might have heard of. Several literary journals devoted exclusively to LGBTQ writers and fiction, most notably the Gay and Lesbian Review and Sinister Wisdom, have been around for years, featuring important work by both new and veteran authors. Mostly digital now. If you have a library card, you can find a couple of these on Press Reader, the library's digital resources devoted to digital magazines and newspapers. Here's a list of annual literary awards and their websites. They cover a variety of titles and genres and are a great resource for discovering new authors and books. Probably the most highly regarded are the Lambda Lammy Awards and the Stonewall ALA Awards or selected by the American Library Association. And don't forget Sci-Fi Awards down here, the Galactics. And while this program is mostly focused on adult fiction, it is important to note just how far LGBTQ writing has come for all age groups, young, adults, teens, kids, and children. TCPL has a wide variety of these titles that kids and adults can read for fun and to find representation of themselves in the stacks. The freedom to read is guaranteed by the Constitution as, and is essential to our democracy, but it is continually under attack, never more than now. Whether in 1920 or 2022, books with LGBTQ themes and characters are frequently banned and challenged in school districts and public libraries for obscenity and age inappropriateness. It is important to remember this thought from the American Library Association's Freedom to Read Statement, which the Gwinnett County Public Library proudly supports. The written word is the natural medium for the new idea and the untried voice from which come the original contributions to social growth. We must be vigilant about denouncing and fighting censorship of any kind for any reason. So these celebrated authors are established heroes of early 20th and 21st century LGBTQ plus literature. Their work is a great starting point for someone looking to read essential authors and books in this era. Their work is critical to understanding the beginnings of modern LGBTQ writing 
and it is important to explore the way these authors found power in reclaiming the margins rather than be defined by or resigned to them. Language helps people discover their own identities and communities. The impact of this work is seismic. Seeing yourself reflected in the pages of a book, even knowing you are represented in the library stacks, can mean so much. I'd like to thank you for viewing this presentation, and I hope you've enjoyed Read with Pride. If you have any questions or comments about this presentation, or if you would simply like a list of the authors and books mentioned here, please email me at mwoodard at gwinnettpl.org, and I will respond as soon as I can. Thanks again for joining us, and happy Pride.